a football official told me they're look they're praying for another miracle for Hanoi. Oh, that's not gonna happen. Chris's team worked for the miracle of Hanoi. They worked their asses off for that miracle in Hanoi. You gotta work for that. Welcome to Across the Line. On this episode, we've got Rick Olivares on the show. Rick Olivares is a veteran journalist in the world of football. He's been around and covering the team for a very long time and the entirety of the game as well. So having him back on as he has returned to the game after a brief hiatus has been quite interesting. He's got a lot of thoughts about the game and he certainly shares all of it here on this program. It's been really nice to get Rick back on. Um, he, like you said, he's been away for such a long period of time, and, it, and it's it's been to the detriment of the game because he, he was so insightful with his journalism. Um, you know, obviously uncovered some some huge stories back in the day, which which he alludes to in this in this in this interview. But it's great to see him back. He's written a couple of very controversial articles, which has uh, reverberated around the football community. A lot of that we've spoke about before in, in the previous podcast, and really enjoyed it you know we we know that it got the backs up of, of a number of people as well so um it's interesting that, that he speaks about that in this episode but for me it's important that we have people who who have an opinion about football and, and are open and honest about their account so it was great that he was able to elaborate on, on some of his um his articles that he's written in, in, in recent weeks and months uh, and it's just great to have him back on the football scene again yeah, a bit of a polarizing figure because he is very opinionated, but that's what you love about Rick. He, he's always going to be Rick Olivares, and he certainly was on this episode, if you guys enjoy it. And uh, all of the insights and uh, discussion that we had on this one, please do subscribe to the show on YouTube, Spotify, and on Apple Podcasts. Um, uh, please do reach out to us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and on Twitter. That's it. Rick Olivares on this Football Friday. Please enjoy. On the show today here on Across the Line, we've got an individual who's got uh, probably more knowledge about Philippine football than most have inside the community. He's been writing about the game for a very long time, and it's a pleasure to have him here on the show. Rick Olivares, how's it going, sir? Jing, Toby, Chris, good afternoon. Thanks for having me on the show. It's all good. I'm excited to appear on your show. And I know and uh, I have to apologize. I've not seen anything because there's just so much work, but I hear good things about your show. And it's, a, it's an honor to be here, especially with these gentlemen who've made a name for themselves in the game or even in broadcasting, like Jing. So it's all good. Thank you. Christopher Greatwich with us as well on this program, as always. And uh, how are you doing, sir? I'm very good, sir. I'm very good. It's, it's nice to get Rick on the show. Um, I guessed it on... His, um, his, his series of interviews last week, uh, he's been doing a collection of articles and interviews uh, based around uh, the 10 year anniversary of the miracle uh, in Hanoi. So yeah, I was on his show for about an hour last week, just talking about myself primarily, which is, which is quite rare. Um, and uh, yeah, he, he, he agreed to come on our podcast, which was, uh, which was very generous of him. So, yeah, looking forward to this one, uh, to be honest, Jing, Rick. It's, uh, like you said, it's rare that we have someone who has the level of insight that, that, that Rick has for, for the domestic game. So, uh, yeah, hopefully he's got some, some interesting, juicy stories for us to, <laughs> to share. Um, <laughs> let's see. Let's see how willing he is uh, over the next, uh, yeah, over the course of this interview. We're not going to get in trouble, are we? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. It's been a breath of fresh air, Rick, <laughs> seeing you back um, and writing about football. Um, Thank you. I, I've been scrolling through the social media and, and uh, I find, you know, uh, a few articles here and there and w by Rick Olivares, and that's an automatic click, you know, to see <laughs> how things are going. And, and you've been quite prolific. How does it feel to be back writing football? Well, feels good, but it wasn't easy coming back. I... There were several instances over the past couple of years where I would write and sneak in an article or two, but and then Bob Guerrero and some of the others would say, hey, man, come on, do more. It was just hard because I was out of the loop. I had not seen local games or even the UAP or NCAA football for, for the matter. So it was really hard. And I don't want to come back in and talk about things that I don't know because that's not right. 
So, but I knew that with the 10th anniversary of the Suzuki Cup, I knew even as early as last year that I was going to be writing a series of retrospectives about everything. And the cool thing was being there and seeing everything, even before that, you know, seeing the buildup. That's why heading to the 2010 Suzuki Cup, I was even telling Dan boldly back then. In fact, it appears in one of the videos, the locker room celebration, where Chadi Pakanya tells me, hey, Rick, you were right. We were going to beat Vietnam. I was that confident. And actually, I got the prediction right, 2-0. Everyone thought I was crazy. But no, I... Well, you, could, you might want to call it a moment of madness, but I, in my gut, I knew that team was going to do well. Why? It's when Chris and Chad Gold came up in 2004. That was a very good team that Aris Kaslib put together. Very good team. But they lacked the coherence and chemistry. Um, obviously, Chris and Chad came in and brought a lot to the team. So if you talk to the guys like uh, Mike Casas, Japit Sablon, or... Even Anto Gonzalez, who was on that team, that did say that Chris and Chad brought a lot of quality. And their appearance on that team also, what, raised the level of the play of the locals. I remember we were watching a UEP football game in 06, and Mike Casas' girlfriend was playing for the Ateneo women's team at that time. And we were talking, and then he was saying that he, he really welcomed the arrival of Chris and Chad because... Of course, now they wanted to beat them, show them that they're just as good. But they knew that those two, those two lads elevated the game, more so when Neil Etheridge came up in 08. And as I recall then, there was, while people were excited because they knew of Neil's potential um, among some of the local players, there was some backlash. But Mike Casas went on record in 2008 to say that you watch out for this guy because he's going to be one of the best things to happen to Philippine football. And he's going to push everyone's button, push every, the envelope. And he was right. He was right, even at the cost of Mike Casas' job as the starting goalkeeper of the Ascals. And at the time, we covered it on Solar Sports. The, uh, from 06 to 08, we were covering the tournaments on Solar Sports. And that was quite a gamble. Uh, Smart PLD they came in, they gave us a, hundred, uh, a million bucks to go cover it. And nowadays, a million bucks sounds like it's chump change. But that was a lot of money back then. In fact, I recall Jing, Chris, and Toby, the late Chris Mons, Monfort, the gen sec of the PFF, who was my coach in Ateneo, he was saying, just give me one month, one month's operating budget of any PBA team. He can run a professional football league in the country. He did the math. He showed the numbers to then President Pierre, uh, Rene Adad. He showed the numbers. We can do it. But that's why we had so many stop starts in terms of local leagues because the money was there, but it was never enough. And then, you know, after you see players getting like, what, 500 bucks? But anyway, I, I came back. Uh, I knew that this was the anniversary, so I started writing, uh, doing a webcast featuring them. That was never in the cards, to be honest. It's just a series of articles. And then I started doing a coaching, basketball coaching uh, webcast with Ariel Van Guardia. And I said, why don't I get these guys on board? So I said, I'm going to get the starting 11 one by one. And it is interesting because they all have similar but also dissimilar recollections of what happened on the lead up. And when you tie everything together, it tells a fantastic story. And... Um, I think it was Rob Gear who said, because er, I think everyone's been watching The Last Dance on Netflix and on ESPN, and Ali and Rob were saying, you know what? Someone should do the first dance. And that was 2010. And I know that I took about a thousand pictures, a lot of videos, a lot. Interviews that many people have not seen, behind the scenes, training. Uh, discussions and there's some even arguments among some of them. So, but good, good art, good stuff, talking tactics and all that. But you know, it's it feels I all of a sudden I'm writing, and then there was this article, if I may. Uh, I I I, in, I was asking about the loss of Ceres, the potential, or if ever, the dissolution of Ceres uh, Negros and. That sparked something, um, as I understand from my editor, 
excuse me, um, about 150 plus thousand people read the article when it first came out. And it just went, uh, a lot of people come, th- the response was 99% overwhelmingly positive, agreeing with it. There was some opposition to it by people in football. But I said, you know, it's, it's not an attack on football. It's not. You have to be concerned. You lose seven of the top clubs in the last three years. You lose big sponsors like Smart, Globe, Suzuki, TV5, ABS, CBN, and more. That has to say something about the state of the game. And I didn't even talk about Bernie Samayo yet. But it's not a knock on anyone. Because, you know, like you, Jing, you also played football during your school days. We're all football fans here. We love the game. And even if I was away, I would still watch, even on TV, or I'd ask Bob Guerrero or some others, like Richie Ganaban, to tell me, hey, what's going on? What's going on? So I, I was kept abreast for, for, for the most part, but I couldn't write because I wasn't there. So starting off with the Suzuki Cup retro, that was a good place. And then I think that article about Ceres, that got it rolling because a lot, I think it was uh, Monchu of Archer's, said, hey, keep going, man, keep going. And a lot, a lot of guys. And I, I said, look, I'm not here to pick a fight. I'm not going to do that. I don't want to do that. Um, it's not a shot on everyone. It's asking everyone to take stock of the game. And I think during this pandemic, a lot of people have just been really reflecting on what's going on in their lives. And this is a good time as any to think about the state of the game and push it back where it's supposed to be. Rick, can I jump in there um, for a go, second? Go, please. Go. Because, well, first of all, you know, I want everyone to understand that we, we, we have you on as a, as a journalist, but you're not a sort of run-of-the-mill journalist. You know, I would say, you know, your style of writing, I mean, you, you, you have your own opinion on this, I suppose, but just a kind of a broader context, like your style of writing is far more uh, in-depth. It's more in your kind of... Uh, I think like an Oliver Bailey, I don't know if remember Oliver Bailey from the Times, UK journalist, very good, that, that sort of style, um, Grant Wall style. It's not your, your standard, yeah. you know, clickbait type stuff. It, it's no, it's no. normally very well that. thought. Yeah, well written, well thought out, methodical, um, you know, different perspectives on things. And, and typically, although people may not always agree with it, it it's it's balanced. It's, it's always there with with... Um, you know, color. You provide a lot of color for for, for different um, uh, instances, examples, moments. So, w- w- with that in mind, you know, the article that you wrote. You know, I-, I would like you to maybe summarize what what you said regarding the current state of the game, because I think that's that might be a good jumping point for, for sure. to to, sure. to progress the the interview. What what was your sort of summary? And I know, like as like you said, I know it got some people's tails up, but I think everyone needs to understand that. Even the podcast that we did last week, Jing, that was that was met with certain opposition. But I think when you sit down and actually listen to the points that we made, a lot of it kind of makes sense. And we're not coming at it from an attack from an attack angle. It, it's simply trying to point out some of the misgivings and maybe shed light on some of the issues. So hopefully, we don't make those same mistakes again. So, what what was your sort of surmise? What was your synopsis i guess of, of that article if you could give us a brief brief overview yeah. of, of what what you said in the article right okay the synopsis basically goes like this i think the game is in trouble when you lose seven big clubs a lot of big sponsors over the years that says something about the state of the game when you're showing it on live stream and not on major tv that says something about the game when the game moved up to number two right behind basketball and it slid to a far third with volleyball leapfrogging over football, that says something. And in many ways, we've uh, fallen back to 2010 in some ways, not, not in everything. Football mm-hmm. awareness is still high. There are a lot more positives today than in 2010. You don't hear stories about corruption anymore, unlike pre-2010. It's probably incompetence or whatever, or the lack of unity. But that's about it. That It was calling, uh, calling out to people to take stock of the game, that there is something wrong in the game. I did an interview with Nono, uh, Nonong Araneta last week that I did not uh, show publicly 
because we we discussed a lot of things that were off the record and for the most part what i can say is he agreed with every one of my points everyone even the state of the game that he even admitted that uh, he has to be concerned but um i think with all due respect to the pff leadership i think a lot of people are just inside that bubble sometimes you don't know you don't see things from the outside and you're used to doing things a certain way so you don't have any have any of that it, uh i don't want to call it lack of initiative but more of you're not seeing everything you're not seeing it with a clear picture it's just you're just have tunnel vision that's it so that was the whole point of that article and then i followed it up with another one asking for account if some people concerned that one pissed off a lot of people mm-hmm. especially in the regions because i was asking for accountability and calling for their heads should they not perform and to be very uh, i'm going to say this publicly for the first time and yes the pff president agreed that there should be accountability and these guys if they're not going to be able to get their jobs done well they should not lead their respective regions um it's hard to write you know uh, I, I could just do all the usual behind the scenes stories, the good stories, the feature stories about clubs and teams. But every now and then you just have to call out the state of the game. And that's what got me banned from uh, the PFF before. I was media officer around the time of 2006 when we were showing it on Solar Sports. And by late 2008, I was banned by Mari Martinez for my exposés about the corruption. I was only reinstated in November of 2010. And uh, I didn't want to come back. I just said, but he, he, he needed something from me, like the sponsorship of Gatorade, since I was handling their marketing and public relations as well. And I wanted to give it to the team. I wanted to give it to Chris's team. Because I knew, in fact, I told management as early as March of 2010, you got to sponsor this team. Because this team is going to win. And they said, they don't have the results to show for it. I said, it'll happen. I promise. But they said, no. Around August of that year, I asked him for a second time. I said, if this doesn't work, you can fire me. It was a bold, bold gamble on my part. But, you know, you got to go with your gut feeling. I had good vibes. Very good vibes. And even if they qualified with the skin of their teeth in the qualifiers, I didn't care. I knew that this team was going to hum. And... It's sad because Chad Gold was a part of that team and Chad was never there for the group stages, even Manny Ott. But you could see, and I, I mean, even for Chris, you know, Chris is being a part of the group stages and semifinals. That's one of the most incredible moments in Philippine sports history. By all rights and purposes, he shouldn't have been there. It should have been his brother. But that's one of those moments that you look back and go, whoa, you know so I look back very fondly. So, but going back to Chris's question, that was the summary, and it's really calling into calling into question a lot of things. Um, Rick, what with with that? Because just just to go back to that to your to your point, and why people why people were so uh, pissed off about the accountability thing, which Jing and I both applauded and lauded on this show last week, because I think it was a huge thing. Um, that we've been harping on about on this show for a, for a number of episodes. What was it that people were so miffed about? I'm 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 a little bit bemused and baffled as to why people would think that what you said was <coughs> was trite or well negative because it's the, surely it's the case. Surely it's the truth. I think Chris, Jing, and Toby. Anytime you ask for accountability and ask people to do their jobs and they're not doing their jobs. They know that you put them in a position of a dangerous position. You call them out. So when you call them out, people start taking notice, start taking stock like, oh yeah. Like I know a couple of, there was an incident recently where this FA, um, they asked for financial help for a particular program, but uh, they were not able to provide all the details and then, fortunately for the PFF, they sent someone over down there to like collate certain materials, and they were caught, like filing probably not the the, the correct report. 
so it happens and i've seen it through the years um in right before you guys right before we left for for the suzuki cup there was this in the pff congress to oust mari martinez uh, I saw a lot of cash, a lot of cash that was earmarked for the FAs to be handed out for them to vote on his behalf to keep him as P- PFF president and to squash any rebellion. And how how did I see that? Because at the time, I was asked by, I was returned as media officer. And Mari asked, can you, can you, with all due respect, I know he's not with us anymore. He asked me, can you write some good stories about us? I said, sure, just show me that there are good stories, right? I'll be fair enough. Mm-hmm. And I think of right before the Congress started, it was a huge amount. You only see that in banks or even movies. And he saw some guys just waiting for the dole outs. And he, he went on to say, like, no, you're not going to get this money until after the, we squash the rebellion. And he was ousted. I, I actually have the video of the entire proceedings, the votings, shouting here and there to the moment that he walks out of the assembly when he was ousted. I have the video because I filmed it with his knowledge, with his knowledge. And, you know, and after that, uh, I went to the PFF and he sat there very sad and people were still going over there asking for their money. <laughs> You're not getting any of this. You're not. So they took it home with them. It's insane, you know, it's insane. So I think people are upset because you, you're calling them out. And a lot of them, some of them are doing their jobs, but not everyone. People are, mm-hmm. but like I said in my article, it, it, not everything's their fault. Because um, with all due respect to people in football, whether you're a player, a coach, an administrator, many of them are not trained for certain things like running a club. They think, or running a, uh, an association, they just think that, okay, all I'll do is just uh, put up a tournament, collect the fees, and do this and do that. No. A lot of them don't understand financial literacy. A lot of them don't understand the, the importance of marketing and public relations and media. They don't. They don't understand the man management side of football. And that's why I think Jurgen Klopp put it very well about what the manager's role is. You manage a lot of things. It's not just the X's and O's. So that's not really their fault. I think it's a systemic error, fault, that has to be rectified. We've seen so many clubs over the years fold because they think in the boon of when after football exploded and took off in 2010, they thought, okay, I'm putting up a football team and sponsors will follow. It does not follow. It does not. What I learned working with Solar Sports when I picked up Bundesliga and La Liga for local uh, consumption um, there's a lot that goes on. You just can't, you just can't promote Barcelona and uh, Real Madrid. You have to promote so Zaragoza, Bilbao, Atlet- Atletico. It's the same thing here. So it's sad when you see the top clubs only get the press, but the lower clubs, they don't. And that was something that I was uh, calling out in the UFL as the media officer. Technically, I shouldn't be doing that because I'm employed by the UFL. But if you wanted the league to survive, you have to help the lower clubs, the lower seeded clubs. The lack of a salary cap, the lack of a, of a draft system did not allow for any semblance of parity. So competitiveness was just out of the window. It's just up for the upper tier clubs. While it's good for them, it's bad for the league as a whole. You see blowouts like 15-1. That's not good on national TV. That's terrible. That's horrible. I mean, who's going to want to watch that? Maybe for the diehard fans of, let's say, Loyola, they'd watch it. But as a whole, it's not. It smacks of the lack of competitiveness, the lack of balance. So that's why you have a division two. But, you know, what, what are the safeguards? I think the league, the, the PFF, has to look into a lot of things. You don't just build things one at a time. If you're doing the PFL right now with only five teams or six teams, I think this early you should start preparing for division two. I think they have to sit down and there should be a lot of dialogue with the clubs on licenses and all that. There's a lot that needs to be discussed because a lot of clubs cannot cope or cannot even comply with the directives. And I think given this pandemic and the state in which we're in, in the whole entire world, I think FIFA or even the AFC will understand that, you know, we cannot, we cannot at this time, unless you want to see the game implode and, 
you know, it's it's frightening. It's it's a good thing Qatar Airways uh, kept their word. If not, can you imagine the fallout? It would be terrible. So there's a lot. There's a lot that needs doing. And actually, uh, I pitched something to Mr. Araneta. Uh, I, I'm not at liberty to discuss it right now because I need to finish the plan. And it, it should help football. But I'm we're going to bury it in a couple of weeks. But he liked it. It could really help football, everyone. It, but it's going to need everyone's buy-in. I don't think it's going to be difficult to mount it. But if everyone buys into this plan, it's going to help the game across the board, across the entire nation. Uh, I, I wish I could divulge it right now, but not until Mr. Arlet uh, approves it. He liked it in principle. He gave me the green light to work on it. Um, once I submit it to him, then we'll ask other people to join in on the plan because this is not one thing that I can do or Mr. Araneta can do. It's going to take a lot of people to get this done. But if it does happen, it's going to help the game in a very, very big way. That's all I can say for now. Well, everybody's going to be uh, looking forward to the big reveal in a couple yeah, weeks. Uh, promise, promise, Jing. It could be a game changer for everyone. When did you start off in the game, Rick? I played when I was in school uh-huh. under Chris Monfort. And uh, I, I, in terms of skill, it wasn't there. But the heart was there. So um, I never stayed too long because you have to juggle academics as well. Then when Chris Monfort became GenSec, since I was cr- close to Chris, uh, he would allow me to watch the national team. He would allow me to to go to the PFF. Uh, Johnny Romald is, is my father's classmate in Ateneo. And you were already I, a writer at this time? Sorry? I was, already, I was writing as far back as in college just to earn extra money, to go out on dates and buy my records and all that stuff. Uh, I would write about football, but not too much. More of music and other stuff. And later on, I got moved to sports, which I really wanted to do. It's more of basketball. But... I love, I love the game, and I would sneak it in every now and then. It was tough because I remember my editors would say, oh, football, no one reads about that. No one really cares. So more often than not, they would remove it from the pages of the newspaper. But, every not, but if I got them a good story, they would always concede, okay, since you got us a good scoop, an expose here, okay, I'm going to run your football story. So it was tough. It was that tough. I had so many articles bumped off, which is why I created my blog. Because a lot of the stuff that they didn't want to run, I put it on my blog. The exposés, the exposés at first, they did not want to run it. They did not. But it was only when I was handed the actual proof, the actual receipts, which I still have to this day, because I kept it. Um, that's when my the editor said, like, okay, let's run it now in the paper. So now it became a really big thing. But... My blog, that's where I uploaded the actual interview where the president admitted that there were some problems with the money. I could not put that anywhere except on my blog. And this one went viral because everyone in the country was listening to the admission that there was a problem with the money. And that's how it all started. It takes a lot. but On one hand, some people look at you with distrust. Some people cheer you on as a hero in some way but it's tough because I think the lessons of 2010 also for me personally it hurt that's why I left the game after four years because um, and after 2010 I for some I don't know how to say this I don't want to bring back old wounds and especially concern some people but I was removed as media officer in 2011 I was shocked so when I headed to Panahad I was no longer media officer I said, what the hell? But in a few months' time, they brought me back. They brought me back because some of the guys who took over either were busy doing something else or get, not getting it right. So it's been a very it's been a love-hate thing for me, covering football. It's tough mm-hmm. when you write about things that call into question certain things, like Michael Weiss. I regret it, you know? I mean... It's not fun taking shots at people. You have to, have to understand. It brings me no joy. Even with the PFF president, it, uh, Mari Martinez, it brought me no joy because he's a family friend. His wife, 
my father helped her music career grow because my father was in the music industry. But what I learned in school was you do the right thing. You do what's right, you know, even if it's the unpopular decision. So I've paid for it. You know, uh, it hurt, especially after 2014. And that's why I left. That's why I left the game. And I said, oh, screw it. I'm going to help volleyball since I've been involved in volleyball as well. So I'm immensely proud of what I've done for volleyball, helping put together a champion team like Bali Pure and others, you know. So, but, you know, when you love the game, you may get out of the game, but the game stays in you. And to be honest, it hurt not watching the national team or even the UFL in its final years and watching the PFL take off. It hurt. I was actually into Bernie Sumayo, the first because uh, Kathy, the late Kathy Nazareno, who is a colleague, a very old friend of mine, she was the one who got me reinstated as a media officer. She said, no, I'm only going to work with Rick, so you either bring him back or this isn't happening. So the PFF leadership said, okay, you can bring him back. It was tough because some of the guys there didn't, did not like me. But when did I give a shit about that? Oops, I'm sorry. Should I have said that? She's <laughs> completely fine. There, so. But um, there, I was the first person to re- interview Bernie Sumayo, but I couldn't run it because I like Bernie, but I saw some problems right off the bat. I said, oh, this is not going to work. There are going to be some problems here. Like, I thought that he did not understand the local football landscape, and I talked about it with Bob Guerrero. And Bob said, no, Rick, you got to be optimistic. I said, I am. Of course I'm optimistic, but I'm also a realistic person. I've been around this for so long to know that he's going to run into a lot of opposition. And that's exactly what happened. And uh, sometimes when you come into the game with a lot of good intentions, you get chased out. There. So I've seen it happen to a lot of people, a lot of people with good intentions. You know, I've never gotten rich from this game. I never asked of that. All I wanted to do is just write a good story. That's all. I didn't care for anyone's position. I didn't read. When Mari brought me back and asked me to be the media officer, he said, take out Sedelf Tupas. I said, no. Why are you going to take Sedelf out? It's my friend. Then, but Mari insisted, no, no. He calls up Dan, no, take out Sedelf. I want Rick. So I told Sedelf, I ain't taking the position. No, I don't need it. I don't need it. I mean, me of all people, I don't need it. But Mari said, no, 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 no. Because he needed something to show the PFF Congress that Rick brought in Gatorade for the Federation. To bring in at least a million bucks and all that stuff for the federation. So, but Dell said, Rick, no, it's okay. Then, then Dan said, no, it's okay, Rick, don't worry about it. So, Delph is joining us anyway, so it's no big deal. It's just a different, there's a shift in title, and we know that you can get the job done. So, that was an honor being reinstated. And um, I recall before when I was banned, guys like Chris, Phil, and James. Uh, Mike Casas, even Neil Etheridge, they would meet, even Aris Kislib would say, hey, come over to San Beda where we're training. Or Ultra, come over. And I'll let you talk to the boys. And I said, what? The PFF's right there. Don't worry about it. We won't tell them that we talk to you. But, you know, so uh, that was pretty cool. Pretty, pretty cool. This was around 2010? That, 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 that period that you were speaking of? Um... No, we, we talk, when with Aris Kislib, 2008, 9. 2008. But when did you start? What year would you 06, say that was? 06, when I returned. I was, I was in the States at the time, so I mm. returned. And um, when I returned to the Philippines, I was working for Solar Sports. And, right. and that's how I got to cover them because we showed them on, on TV, on cable TV. So I knew of Chris, I knew of Chad, but I had not met them. So we went down there. Um, there was Ern Nieras and Wacky Preisler and Ed Formoso. They came to the office and said, we all met up with the PFF and they represented the PFF. Okay, we're going to be showing the qualifiers and so on and so forth on solar. So that's how it all started. So we flew down to Iloilo. We covered the game. And the response was fantastic because prior to that, the national team was never covered on TV. 
it was fantastic. And I remember, and I, I shared with Chris the other day, something I wrote back in 06 or 07, that press conference at Mizuno. And I was shocked. That's why I wanted to m- write more detailed things about the team. Because like, I remember, distinctly remember, cl- remember it very, very clear that they were asking Chris and the others, like, what's your favorite color? What's your favorite food? Do you know, do you know any Tagalog words? And when I looked around me, I said, I'm the only legitimate sports writer here. Everyone else here is from showbiz. So I asked the PFF, why, why did you invite these people? You should have invited the other guys because I think Sedelf at the time was still based in Bacolod or somewhere. You should have invited the others. I'm the only. The, I remember Chris saying, you know, that there's only one guy here asking football questions. Can you ask football questions? And I wrote about it. Do you remember, what my, blog, do you remember what my response was in, in, the, in, the, in the podcast that we shared? Do you remember what I said I ended up having to do just to keep my, uh, keep my sanity during yeah. the course of the interview? Do you remember what, what did I do? Well, do you remember? No, 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 sorry. I, uh, I ended up making up, uh, trying to oh. incorporate movie titles. Yeah, that's right, that's right, yeah. yeah. Into, yeah. The, into, the, into the interviews. Yeah. Because the, the questions were just ridiculous, so they I just were. had to entertain myself somehow. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so, so I just think I started incorporating movie titles. And How'd you I do? I said to the boys... <laughs> Uh, I did pretty good. The example I gave to Rick was the, one of the questions, actually one of the better questions that I got was, um, how long do you think it will take for football to become big in the Philippines? <laughs> so, I said, uh, so I said about seven years. So yeah, I got, I got, I got that movie <laughs> title in. Uh, I think even in our run, I think one of the boys managed to get in Pirates of the Caribbean. Don't ask me how. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I think someone managed to work that one in there um it was just a different era though wasn't it um, it was rick at that time i mean obviously there was no notoriety there was no real public interest outside of maybe the pocket hotbeds um you know maybe in bacola or ilo ilo obviously we, we had just come back from from bacola for the uh, would have been the asean championships yeah, type, you know, formerly known as the Tiger Cup, now known as the Suzuki Cup qualifiers. Yeah. So we and we were playing in front of like you know twenty five, thirty thousand people. Yeah. You know, down down there, and we and we were like movie stars for for two weeks. Then you come up to Manila and you think, oh, maybe things had changed, but lo and behold, they hadn't. It was it was just it was just a you know surreal environment. You go from on the in the same country, you go from being such you know, just Beatlemania to come back to the media and, and the, from the from the capital and just there was no level of interest whatsoever. And that was yeah. something that I found frustrating. I know it's something that, you know, other journalists within the sport who were trying to promote it, that was obviously difficult from your end as well. Um, do, do you have any, I mean, we, we actually spoke about this a little bit last week, didn't we, Jing? We were talking about why perhaps football hasn't managed to, to latch on here as, as other sports, also primarily basketball has. I mean, what, what's your take on it, Rick? What, why, why in that period between 2010 where it was just, you know, just fervor of excitement, we obviously had some really exciting flashpoints post that, you know, things like the Clear Dream Games, which you're wearing a shirt today. You know, we had the LA Galaxy Games, some World Cup mm-hmm. qualifiers that seemed to generate huge... Um, spectator numbers in, in uh, at Rizal, you know what? Why hasn't it latched on? In your opinion, what what's what's your take on, on why it hasn't managed to sort of stick with the Philippine fo- Fili- in, Philippine football public? That's a very interesting question. Uh, there, in my opinion, there's several factors. One is the attitude of media and uh, corporate sponsors towards football. I'll give an example. Um, mm-hmm. After I left Solar Sports in 08, I joined uh, Gatorade in, as a, their PR and, and marketing guy. And the one th- what, what I learned in Solar was if you wanted to show La Liga or promote La Liga, and I said I was wanted to go with Barca and Real Madrid, they would tell us, no, you show the other teams because we are La Liga. So if you just want to show Barca and Real, Talk to them, they'll, they'll mm-hmm. charge you more. 
It was the same thing with the Bundesliga. You just can't show Bayern. You have to show everyone else. In the NBA, the one thing I learned was, I remember I was putting Kobe Bryant here, and they would say, no, you can't use only Kobe Bryant. You have to put in two other players. Because the NBA is not Kobe Bryant. We have a league of stars. Having said that, I think you need to put a face. One thing I learned in my marketing, being a marketing guy also, and many people don't know that I do a lot of marketing, you need to put a face to the game. Working for Mindshare, which is a British multinational with clients like Chow King, KFC, Adidas, Nike, HSBC, and Gatorade, just to name a very few. Now they've bagged Unilever. They will always ask you if you come over there asking for a sponsorship. They will say, yeah, who's there? Who's over there? I don't know who's there. And that's exactly what I encountered in March of 2010. Yeah, who's there? Yeah, you have Phil and James, Guapo, Ganun Lang, but... Oh, these guys are losers. That's exactly what they said. They're not winning. So mm. why should we support? So that's one. I think with all due respect to, to everyone, Chris, all you guys, what the game needs is to put more faces, to, to introduce the personalities mm. and the game. Coaches, players. Like, who doesn't know Jurgen Klopp or Alex Ferguson? Or Jose Mourinho. Everyone in this world knows them. You don't have to be a football fan to know who these guys are. You don't have to be a basketball fan to know Michael Jordan. So you need to put a face to the game. Now that the young husband brothers have retired. Okay, who's the face of local football? No one can say exactly who it is right now. So that's why, actually, I want to make proposals to the PFF. Every club has to be responsible. You pick out one, one or two, three players. Okay, who's going to be the face of this team? How do we promote th- this team? Because people need to know who these people are. That's why it's, you have to promote them, to write about them, for people to get to know them. It is that important. That's why I've always tried to write about the players, who they are. Like today, I wrote an article about the effect of the 2010 Suzuki Cup, and I wrote it from the perspective of Patrick Reichelt, Angel Girado, and Nate Berkey. Where were they in 2010, December of 2010. That's the article I wrote today. So you need to, you need to introduce these people. You, you, but the tough thing for most sports writers, they just write game recaps. I, I, I am one of the few who can write recaps, feature stories, or even write analysis. Most cannot. So it's tough. You need to promote the players. You need to do that. Which is why in Gatorade, I, I, I even said, let's get Chifi Kaligdong. Here's another thing. Um, this I don't want, this this shouldn't please do not take this the wrong way. Uh, it's not meant to be discriminatory in any manner, but um, you also the the homegrown guys need to step up because um, I'll give an example. If we go to basketball, in the late around 2008 or even from the late 90s to about 2008, the national team in uh, the pre-Gilas program, about 80% of the players were Philams. While they were popular, you did not get a lot of uh, the massa crowd, as they call it. Well, if you look at 2013, there were only till two Philams on that team. The rest were homegrowns. Uh, I think that, one, the, the homegrowns were able to pick up their game, improve, and that helped. So it's not, to, not meant to be a race thing, and definitely not. But you need to balance it. You need the homegrown guys so that the homegrown people will say, oh, he's one of us. They're not, you know, they're Phil James, everyone, Neil, all those guys. People know them, but you also need the locals to back it up. So that way, oh, you know, you have all these guys over there. So that's one. Why has it taken off? I think a lack of understanding by the powers that be on how to run. I don't want to tell them how to run. And they know how to run a league. But I don't think they've done a good job in even the clubs in making it work with their sponsors. People think that you just slap a logo on the kit, on the shirt, on, on, on the pants. You know, that's good enough. Then you post it in social media. Definitely not. That's not the way the world works. I mean, 
everyone says social media is, is changing the world. Sure it is, but everyone's out there. So how do you stand out with all the noise out there? People have to understand that there is no one fixed game plan for that. It's dynamic. It's constantly changing. So clubs have to be on their toes. That's why the media officer is very, very important. It's not just writing a press release. Look, people can re spot the press release a mile away. And that's not going to help. The moment they know it's a press release, they're not going to read it. So if you tell good stories about a team, you introduce them as personalities, the manager, people have to know who they are. That's going to help. It's, gonna, it's a slow buildup, but that's how it is. If you want to take the pitch on pitch analogy, it's a slow buildup. And that's just how it's going to be. It has to be that way. And in my honest opinion, having been a marketing person for the NBA, Bundesliga, La Liga for solar sports and other stuff, I've seen it. So I understand that. And that's one thing that does not change. You need to put a face to the game. You need, to, you need the clubs to understand their responsibilities to their corporate sponsors. The players need to understand that. I, I remember in Gatorade, I got the uh, Semirad brothers who were playing for San Beda. And I said, you know what, guys? This is going to look good in your portfolio. You're all students. We cannot pay you a max deal because we're, you're just students. But if you take this, it'll open your portfolio. And true enough, after that, they, they became uh, modeling stars and they got a number of uh, endorsers. So I think people have to understand the marketing aspect of the game. People need to be educated about the game. Look, people understand football. It's been around for so long. I, I beg to disagree that people don't understand the game. Well, not everyone understands all the basketball, basketball rules anyway, right? I think that there's a lot. So we've talked about the faces to the game. We talked about the financial literacy, the lack of marketing. We've, uh, another aspect would be the media. Because many of them are predisposed towards basketball. I'll give you, here's another thing. Why, did the, why is the UAP so popular? And this is a fact. It is not conjecture. Uh, the, when the UAP took off in the late 90s uh, and all the way up to today, if you look at the profile of the brand managers today, the brand managers, the people deciding what money goes into what account, these are the people who grew up watching UAP basketball. They go to schools like Ateneo, La Salle, and UP. So that is what they grew up watching, so that's what they're going to support. It is important to reach out to these people so they will understand who, what, the, what football is. And that is from actual experience working in Mindshare. And we have over 100 clients, 100 clients here in Manila. We have, what, three, four floors in BGC, each one handling their own account. I handled Gatorade specifically. So you, you have to be able to understand what you're up against. I think there needs to be an intensive plan for each club, for each league, for even the federation. How do you make it? How do you grow the game? It's not as simple as putting up a, <coughs> a tournament. You know, it's not that simple. There are a lot of things. Yeah. I mean, anyone can put up a tournament, right? I ran the Ateneo Football League with Relly San Agustin. Our first year, we had 46 teams playing in the league. You know, so. There's a lot, Chris, Jing, and Toby. There's a lot that needs to be done for many, 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 many sides of the game. Marketing, media, uh, from the club level. People have to understand all these responsibilities. And what I've been, mentioned to you actually goes is part of the master plan that we're trying to craft. Uh, it's just one aspect. But uh, like I said, you know, it's a process. It's not going to happen overnight, but everyone needs to buy into it. Every club needs to understand what's at stake here if you really want to grow the game. You know, uh, In my opinion, and I wrote about this also a few weeks ago, there's a cycle of 10 years where a team is built to win a championship or qualify somewhere. We've seen that hard evidence I've written about Germany winning it, about Vietnam's build-up to winning it all. Um, I... There's a part of me think, that thinks that we've missed the window. We should have won in 2012, 2014. Maybe 2012, we should have won it, the Suzuki Cup. These windows are 
I mean, if you look at that team right now, it's only Neil Etheridge who's playing, who's the only holdout from that team, who's still playing or is on the national team. Of course, we have better players, but much better players. It's a much more talented team today. But you need to keep them going, and which is why I'm concerned. You lose Serious, or if we do lose them, or whatever form it is in a few weeks from now, I mean, we're going to be losing some players. And I think like guys like Schrock, Stefan Schrock, Wow, he's one of the most ta- insanely talented players here in Asia. How come not many people know who Stefan Schrock is? That goes to my whole point. People need to know them. I'll give you another example here, Jing, Chris, and Toby. Um, in 2011, in one of the tournaments, I was called to ABS-CBN to do some commentary as the game was going on. There was an informal survey done inside the newsroom who the most popular player on the Askel was, on the Askel sorry. And guess who won? It's not Phil Young Aspen. Really? It's, Chi- it's Chiefy Kaligan. Chiefy, yeah. Chiefy. So my point being, you have to build up, not what, so when Chiefy's gone, okay, who's next? You have to build up everyone. You have to build up the Chris Great, which is of the world, the Rob Gears, the Ray Yonsons, the Angel Girados. You have, you have to build them up. It's not like oh, um, Ray, Ray, Ray's mom is from Cebu. Ray speaks even better Cebuano than English. So that's why I was pushing it as media officer. We should get, we should do some video. I, I did a, I shot a video when we were in Namdin. And I posted it on the web. I said, Ray, call out to the Cebuanos to watch the games on TV. And Ray spoke in Cebuano. So... All, I think I, I asked each and every one of the players on that team say something to the fans out there. You have to reach out. Jing, you know this. You're, you're a guy who's also active on social media. Engagement is key. Many mm. people don't understand it. They think I post something on YouTube and Facebook, on Twitter or IG, that's good enough. That is not good enough because everyone posts. Engagement is key. It is so important. I'm saying that as a marketing person and not as a journalist. And... I think many people don't understand that. They do not understand that. That's why I tell our clients, our, our brand ambassadors, anytime someone asks you for a photo, a selfie, go take it. You know why? Because the media managers, those who are holding the money that will be given out as sponsorships, they look for social media impressions. Like if you Google, for example, Chris Greatwich. <coughs> You're going to look at whatever's posted out there. How many fans post pictures of me, with, or for example, with them with Chris Greatwich, with Jing Amlang, with Toby, with Phil Young Osman. They're going to look for that. If the social media impressions are low, that means they don't resonate with the fans. That's why the clubs, the federation, they need to understand that. That's why I wrote about it. They need to understand the marketing side of this game. It is that important. And I, that was a crucial learning from the NBA they told me off, Rick. Just don't put, just don't uh, promote Kobe Bryant. Promote, at, yeah. If you notice, if you look at the NBA poster, there are always at least three people, at least three players. And I get it, I totally got it, and it changed the way I looked at marketing. And it still is the truth to this day that has not changed. But social media tactics they have to change because you have to engage people. <coughs> there, that's it. <laughs> There's probably a few more, but uh, that's what I can say at this point. At this point in time. So, so essentially, like yeah, having a connection with these players, right? A personal connection that yeah. you can draw. Yeah. Um, that has been um, a key element in 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 sort of the success of of leagues that do thrive. And uh, it's interesting to say that when you do like uh, create a little bit of a survey right now, who is top of mind? Uh, if you think of Philippine football, then you would say Stefan Schrock um, yeah. is is the is the yeah. main person that comes to mind. But you don't see him on billboards. You don't see him, you know, uh, on the back of buses, right? Um, still, the most um, publicized yeah. figures of football remain in that era of 2010 to 2012, somewhere around there. You know, um, they would still be the most recognizable of of uh, personalities, which is quite interesting, you know, that when, that when you think of it um, in, in hindsight, 
like that, definitely. Um, there needs to be a little bit of work in that department because in terms yeah. of in terms of performance, in terms of achievement, uh, the team is not lacking. I mean, we just a couple of years ago, we were in an Asian Cup. Yep. What was my mind? What, what are we doing there, right? I mean, 2010, prior to that, it's just dark ages, and then now we're in the Suzuki Cup. Uh, sorry, in, in the Asian Cup. But the level of popularity did not necessarily translate. I think that's one of the aspects that was very confusing to a lot of people because here we are at the top of our game, at the peak of our powers, and nobody cares. That was a bit strange. Uh, what was that experience like for you, From uh, especially since this was during the time of uh, presumably of your, your hiatus, right? 2014, yeah. was it, uh, until further? I, I saw it coming, Jing. I saw it coming. Um, people were, I remember... I remember people in the press room or even editors saying, or even some people in the corporate world saying that football is just a... But what is the definition thing that happens for the way? So football never went away. So it's not a fad. Mm. Um, it lost some of its shine, definitely, because of, um, one, the rise of vo- volleyball. You know, uh, a lot of people, well, I saw that coming as well. But um, what they were, here, here's, here's something that, if I'm going to make that volleyball analogy. If you look at the team like F2, and that in, the team is made up of all LaSalle la, uh, uh, Lady Archers, you know. And um, the thing is, and, and what, I, what I advocate when I teach journalism for people who want to start out, you reach out to your immediate community. What is F2's immediate community? LaSalle. So you get the LaSalle fans. And then once you've gotten the LaSalle fans, then you branch out. So that's, all, that's the concept behind regional football, whether it's in the UK, in Germany, or in Europe. The fans of Manchester will be split among City and United. The fans in the Merseyside will be split among the Liverpool and Everton. So that is your immediate community. That is the concept behind regional football. You represent a, a town and city. You must reach out to that city. How do you do that? You have to do a lot of promotions. You go door to door like, hi, we are from Negros. We are Ceres. You know, this is Patrick Reichelt. This is Stefan Schrock. This is so and so. This is who we are. But you need to create that connection. You need to engage them. You need the fans to come out. I think a football official told me they're look they're praying for another miracle for Hanoi. Oh, that's not gonna happen. Chris's team worked for the miracle of Hanoi. They worked their asses off for that miracle in Hanoi. You gotta work for that. Miracles don't happen overnight. It's a product of that you know hard what? work. You know what I think with that, Rick, sorry to interrupt you, mid mid no. mid flow there. It's like, you know, we, we can only do so much on the pitch, right? So there's that, yeah. that, that, that football on the pitch component. It, like you said, it took us time to get to that point. But once we got to that point, we did our job. Mm. We, the players, did our job, right? Mm. So then you have to delegate that responsibility to someone else. Like, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. And I think we did our bit. I don't think I was the best, but I think there were certain other players who were really good at engaging with the community, football community, general public in, you know, shopping malls and, and did all that kind of stuff. And I didn't really care for that, to be honest. That, that, wasn't, that wasn't me. I, I was more focused on, 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 on doing the, the job in hand and, and, and influencing things in, in, in different ways. Mm-hmm. Um, but one thing I, th- I think is really interesting that you hit upon that is, that's really an MO of ours that we talk about so often is about the community, is that community aspect. Because my, my, my take on, on what you're saying there is, is there isn't an immediate football community at present because we've tried to go to the locations, we tried to go to the provincial cities mm. and connect and engage, but that hasn't worked. So we're now back to this being in the metro as, as a central hub uh, and and now we're finding ourselves having to generate a brand new community so uh, you know without divulging too much of what, what you're going on and what you're doing with with, with the federation etc because it might have some crossover but how are, how are clubs you know how are clubs going to engage in their new communities in order to promote or start to promote 
the league as it stands now? Because I'm assuming that's going to be very, very difficult because yeah. we've had the jump start of 2010. Mm, definitely. There doesn't seem to be much to kind of write home about at this particular moment in time. So how, how do you propose that that potentially okay. would happen? Here's something that I've advocated and I've taught in my marketing classes or even what I've brought over to Gatorade. Um, and I, I, I've spoken about reaching out to your community. But when I say your community, what it, from your immediate community, like for, I'll give an example. When I returned from the States, I was gone for so long. No one knew me. People had forgotten me. But that's not the point. I mean, it's not an ego thing. So I started writing about the Ateneo basketball team for the Ateneo website because I was writing about the Ateneo basketball team for Ateneans because that is my immediate community. Mm -hmm. The cool thing was, so people started to get to know me. After a while, you have people from, someone from LaSalle, someone from UST, someone from the PBA. Can you write about my team? So that's how... I guess I made a name for myself for by going outside my community. So what is the what is how does it relate to football? I think one of the faults for many clubs or even the federation or the FAs is to keep preaching to the choir. We hear it. It's such a cliche thing, but we keep preaching to the choir. The choir will be there, there's this analogy in uh, they call it in mu in the music industry in the early years of the new millennium. They called it street team marketing. So if I had this band in New York, I'm going to look for my fans in New Jersey and say, hey, here are a bunch of CDs, here are a bunch of merch, go spread it out, go put up your own listening parties and all that stuff. So they were looking for new guys to convert. That's the idea, between, that's the idea behind street team marketing. And I applied that over here with Gatorade because we were trying to reach out to new audiences. Uh, to new markets, I think for football teams, what is your immediate community? So you have your built-in fans already. So those built-in fans should try to look for new fans. So where do you go for new fans? You go to the schools. You go to the young. Because they're the guys who will follow the game. What is the other football analogy? The success of 2010, the kids who were watching, the kids, and I'm talking about the kids, the kids who watched the 2010 Suzuki Cup, they will be the next Asgals. They will be the ones to carry football. We're going to see that in another generation. It's too, in 2014, 2015, we were seeing some of our youth and women's teams winning or qualifying. That has never happened before. But I think the, you know, the, there are financial concerns. The buildup stopped. It stopped. Even in terms of money. It started to, what, uh, it stopped trickling in. So these are the teams that are supposed to mature by 2020, but then the pandemic also hit. So that retards the growth somewhat. Mm. I wrote in an article, I said that Filipinos, and this is a fact, it is not an opinion. Philip, young Filipino teams are competitive at a very young age, but the moment they hit their teens, they're no longer competitive. Why? Because they start to look for alternative careers. Like, I don't have a career in football. That's why the club culture is so important. So, but going back to your question, you need to not only preach to the choir, but look for new choir members. That's tough, but that's how it is. That is how it is. You have to build those communities. You have to branch out. Um, I think... You know, basketball in two thousand. We could we when I before I left Mindshare, we commissioned a survey, uh, a national survey, and the results were very telling. After two thousand thirteen, we all know basketball is a national sport. It became even more popular. Even more popular. Imagine in Iloilo or Bacolod, bastions of football. It ate and eroded into the popularity of football over there. I remember covering a football tournament in Barotac Nuevo. And the football field in Barotak is next to a basketball gym. And I remember pointing out the analogy, hey, there's no one playing there in the gym. Everyone's in the field. But now if you look at their basketball gym, they got a lot of people playing there. So they ate into football's market. I think, you know, there has to be a, a strategic think tank 
by the powers that be, by the people, by the stakeholders, what do we do? Everyone has to buy into it. And that's one of the things that I'm working on. And I, I can't wait to roll it out. And Sir Nonam was saying that we're not going to wait for the pandemic to end for, to roll this thing out. Because when it ends and the vaccine is available, we're going to hit the ground running with this plan. So um, the things that I mentioned to you right now, Jane, uh, Chris, and Toby, these are some of the things that will find its way into that master plan. And um, I've talked about financial literacy. It's one part of it, but there's, an, there's this nice event to tie everything in and to show the whole Philippines that football is alive and well. <clears throat> I, I promise in a few weeks I can reveal it. I just need Sir Nonong's approval. He's approved it uh, offhand, but uh, I'm working out all the, f the details, the small details. But there's a lot. That, uh, there's a lot. I, I'm, I can't say I'm good at everything. I, I know some of it, and some people love to run some of those aspects. But there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And I think it can be done. Definitely think it can be done. Is I think one of the, one of, go, go, ahead, go ahead, go ahead, Jing. No, no, you go. No, no, no. Because you mentioned there that uh, you, you're you're putting in a lot of this work in order to show that football is alive and well. Uh, is that how you feel about it? Um, is that how you uh, look at the game? Because there's a lot of people within uh, the community that would look at it as 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 something not as rosy of a picture as of the moment, right? So. Do you feel that way that it is alive and well? And if so, no, it's what, not. What, what gives you an impression that it could be recovered? It's not alive and well. I think it's... We've slid back. And the term that I used was back, backslide. Uh, we've slid back quite a bit. Um, but that happens. If you look at Vietnam, Vietnam went to the same thing. And some... they. But I think Vietnam is, and this is the story of the Philippines. We're not united, man. We're not. We're not one people. We like to say that it's we're only united when people take shots at us. But we're not. The football community, is, since I've been covering it, has been fractured. Fractured. It's bound by money, temporary alliances, and benefits. And that's sad. You have a lot of people in the game who only care about what they can get off the game. I admire people who work in the game because it's, it's a good thing to do. When you do things for the good of it, the money comes. Just don't ask for it. Some people do it because they're looking, they're waiting for dole outs. And that's been part of the problem. So they're only, you know, they're bound by what they know and what they don't know and the, the, what they want. That's a huge problem. You need people who really... Ha you have a lot of people with good intentions. We've seen it over the years. But you see a lot of people put off. Uh, you know, you see a lot of people put off. You see, like, what those guys did for, like, in Tuloy Don Bosco. That was fantastic, man. Really fantastic. But that needs more support. But, you know... There's not a lot because people have their own agendas. We're not united. Everyone has their own ideas. Everyone has their own fiefdoms. I use that word term fiefdom because pre-2010, everyone had their own thing going. When the NCRFA was broken apart because they wanted more votes in the PFF Congress, how is that right? You, that's supposed to be the Federation for NCR. Then you're asking guys like Rifa to vote. What the hell? What the hell? That's not so, right. Are you suggesting that there, there needs to be a clean-out in order for it to, to rise back up? Definitely. But people are not going to give up their power. They're not. After 2010, you saw people clinging on to, oh, this is my turf. Yeah. This is my turf. And um, they were trying to integrate themselves, but when they saw some people trying to horn in on the action, no, this is my turf. Can't right. come on my turf. And you can't imagine that uh, this time around you're not going to face opposition with regards to implementation of a, a master plan, so to speak. So how do you plan to overcome uh, that scenario of individuals who, of course, would want to protect their own By interests? looking for the good people who want to work with the game. Mm -hmm. You look for the good people. You look for the people who want to do this because they love the game. You know, it's a tragedy that Bob Guerrero is not writing about football. 
It hasn't been for some time now. It's a bleeping tragedy. Mm. Yeah, the guy has given his heart to the game, like you, Jake. Breaks my heart. Yeah, Bob exactly. Guerrero not not writing exactly, about football. Yeah. But uh, why 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 is sport still polarizing people? Why why people have to look at that? We're not blaming anyone. It's just it's a it's a systemic problem. The system has to be cleaned up. That's why there should be accountability. If there is no accountability, this thing is going to perpetuate itself. We're going to see. We've been, this has been happening for the longest time. It's not changed. It's not. In some ways, we're back to certain levels before 2010, the Suzuki Cup. In some ways, but not everything. If you ask me, the national team is in better shape, far better shape. But, you know, um, and I like the Askels development team. That's what they said. They were bringing in the homegrowns to help compete. And that's a good move. That is a good move. But the national team is not can only carry Philippine football for so far. You need the clubs. You need the grassroots. You need that has to be very seamless. That that's why I was upset. Okay, I'm not a fan of the super clubs. I'm not. I'm not a fan because no parity means you don't have a it's not a competitive league. It's gonna be a joke like La Liga. It's only two clubs exchanging the championship year after year. You know, they just buy the best players, and we're not a country like that that can afford to buy a lot of. Just at this point, people have to realize football is all about disposable income. It is an expense. There is no return return of investment. That's why I keep saying, the clubs have to understand how do you make the sponsors happy? How do you give it back so they keep coming back? As it is, a lot of the club uh, sponsors have left, and they're. And they're not happy with the game. They're not happy with the state of the game. You know? So there's, there, there's a lot. And something has to happen. And it's hard to constantly call it out. <coughs> I think after writing that article about Ceres and the other clubs leaving, um, some people were, sa- were saying, you know, don't be too negative. And that's the problem with the Filipino. You, know? they, you call <laughs> things out, um, you know, he's a bad guy. That's why it was tough. It's very tough. You know, people have to understand that you have to point it out. And if you point out something wrong, it doesn't mean that you're bashing that person. Right. When you cuss them out, that's bashing. You say all sorts of things. But when you're pointing things out, what is the diff? There's no difference between a parent scolding their son. There's no difference. That doesn't. A parent scolding their child doesn't mean they're bashing their child. You're just saying, hey, son or daughter, there's something wrong, and you need to fix this. But if I cuss them out and all that stuff, that's what led to me leaving in 2014 because I wrote about uh, Michael Weiss. And it, it, it wasn't an easy thing, to be honest with you, because I got along with Coach Mike from the get-go. And I remember I had not met Coach Mike, and he called me from Panaad. And No, no, no. It was, actually, it was Kenito Henson who called me. He said, Rick, you're not going to believe what I'm going to tell you. I just met. I was introduced to Coach Michael Weiss. And then he said, yeah, oh, cool, cool. And you know what he said? Uh, the, I think it was a PFF official. It was Chito Manuel who was escorting, uh, who brought Kinito Henson to Coach Michael. And then uh, Chito Manuel, the Gen Sec, said to Coach Mike, I'm, I'm going to introduce you to you, the most famous journalist in the Philippines. And then Michael Weiss said, oh, you must be Rick Olivares. <laughs> 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 he need to call me up and says, Rick, you're not going to believe this story. I said, that's not true. You're, you're the popular guy. You know, but this happened and it was flattering. So, you know, writing the thing about coach did not bring me in any joy. It did not. Mm. It hurt me when I found out from some of the Askos mm. that they were saying, hey, Rick, you shouldn't have mentioned these things. I'm like, what? Are you serious? We were together in the hotel, and you guys all were talking about racism and shit like that. And then now you're telling me I shouldn't write about it. I felt betrayed. I felt betrayed. Like, I've been writing so many good pieces about you guys, and I call out the problems of the national team. And now you're telling me I was wrong in writing about it because it puts you guys in a spot. I never mentioned them. The only guy I mentioned was what was being said to OJ. That's about it. In hindsight, maybe I shouldn't have mentioned OJ's name. But I was upset. Now you hear people talk about Black Lives Matter. What the hell? Really now? Oh, because like it's eight years later. 
six years later, so people are more aware, really, racism is racism. I've lived abroad. I've lived in the States. I've lived in Hong Kong. Sure, I felt it. I understand it. I understand it. You have to live abroad to understand why it happens. Do I get it? Yes, I get it. Do I approve of it? No, but I get why it happens. I understand it very, very well. Are they wrong? Not entirely. No, I get it. I think you have to live abroad to understand why it happens. And people, even immigrants over here, they feel the same thing from the locals. There's this fear thing. But anyway, that's why I left. Because I was upset. Like, what the hell? And I, I, another thing, I wrote something about a football player. And I regret it. Because I felt I was used by someone. And I told myself, this is the last time I'm ever going to be used by someone. The last time. Absolutely the last time. And I felt I did something really wrong to that football player and I was embarrassed because I felt like I was a tool I said I'm going to leave the game and I, I, I remember when I left the UFL just following the fight there were two successive roles of Kaya versus Kaya versus Air Force I think and then Archers versus Army and it was after the latter that I left. It's like, wow, you know, what are we doing here? There were no sanctions in the first game. And then the, because there were no sanctions, the second rumble happened on field at McKinley. So what are we, why didn't we act at this? And everyone was calling for action to, be, the action to happen. Did everyone who partook in that, uh, partake in that rumble, were they sanctioned? No. Some guys were not sanctioned. So I said, what the hell are we doing? We're setting the wrong example. And I shouldn't be calling out management for that because I was working for them. But it had to, I, I, it, I needed to do that to jar the league. You know? I guess it didn't hurt them one bit. But so, okay, let's go on. Let's go on. So like nothing ever happened. But I said that if the money doesn't trickle down to the smaller clubs, but I do know that they were trying to give money also to the to the smaller clubs but there were all these fines but that's what i'm saying you know um we should have had meetings be, uh there you know the uap before the season starts they always sit down all the coaches the players they talk to the management these are the expectations these are the rules the, this is okay ask all your questions right now i think there there are the managers meetings yes but there should be more than that. People have to understand how they comport themselves on the field. Why were there too many fights? Are, you know, we, and Jing, we covered the game together, man. Um, how do you improve the officiating? How do you improve it? Do the, do the referees watch game video after? I it's don't been, know of anything that happened. It's been 10 years. Nothing has exactly. happened so on that front. <laughs> how do you improve the officiating? So if the officiating is not very good and you see all these fights happening, that's not good for the game. And we're seeing it on national TV, Jing. And you and I were covering that. Yeah. And that's not good. Like I said, if the product that you put on TV is not very good, people are going to tune it out. <coughs> you know, they're going to watch you for the fight. They're not going to watch you for the game. Oh, you know, that makes the news. The fight, it's not the game that makes the news. And that's sad, right? So people have to understand that everyone in the game is a caretaker of the game. There's a, there should be a code of ethics. That's why I appreciate a guy like Simon McManamy. The man, even in hot weather, was coming in a suit. <laughs> when he would take off his suit, he'd be sweating like anything. But you know, you see guys like Tim Cohen, there's a respect for the game. And you have to appreciate that. Okay, we're in humid weather. It's probably impractical. But you know, there's a lot. People have to understand the ethics behind it. You know, so... It's a game that has to be defined locally, and uh, sadly, we're not, and not everyone's on the same page. I think the death of the UFL is one of the saddest moments in this country's history, in football history. Why was it allowed to die? Why? Because TV5 bailed out? You know, I, thought, I love the idea of the PFL. I definitely love it, but uh, aren't we rushing things? Are the clubs ready for it? There should be a slow transition to things like that. We shouldn't. I know the money's there and it's mandated by by FIFA, but they have to understand the local situation. They have to, you know. So now everyone's back in the metro because it's not feasible to run regional competition because of the expense. 
there are ways around it, but people just have to understand. Uh, there are. There's always a solution to it. The yes. MBA was successful. Why did it? Sure, people were saying that yeah, it, there was no, uh, there were no cheaper fares back in the day for the MBA. But I think the more the bigger problem the MBA was there was no salary cap, none at all, and then people were just spending mindlessly, and after a while they ran out of money. So people, the finance. So I go back Rick, financial I'm, I'm literacy. Yeah, I mean, with that, Rick, I, I want to be respectful of your time, Rick, because you've given us a lot of information. No, 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 it's all good. It's all good. Um, you know, over the course of this interview, and one of the, one of the things that I wanted to address with you is in one of your articles, you you spoke a lot about one of the previous national league uh, in one of its many guises. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to get this wrong because uh, there's been so many monikers, I, I forget which one's which now. Um, but back in the day, before pre sort of UFL games, there was there was another failed attempt at launching a, a, a national football domestic league, um, and you wrote about that a little bit in, in your article. So, what what I want your opinion on is what are some of the similar issues that we encountered in this formation of the league and in, in the current guys as the PFL, and, and what things do we have to make sure that we, we don't replicate in this post Ceres league as we try to push forward um, in the upcoming years. Because I think we're definitely at a crossroads here with regards yes, to are. domestic football. We and are. we need to make good decisions. We need to make smart decisions. So what are some of the pitfalls and what are some of the things that we should learn and make sure we avoid if we intend to move forward with, with this domestic league, in, in your opinion? The first thing is you put the right people in the right position. People shouldn't be there because they're friends of so-and-so. You have to put the right people in place. People who will inspire. Um, you look at guys like Alex Ferguson or Jurgen Klopp, what they've done for their respective clubs. It might sound like apples and oranges because different leagues. But no, I'm talking again about leadership. Leadership is what I'm referring to here. You have good leaders. You have put people, good people in the right positions. Things will follow. You put people who are men of action, not people who talk. I think that is every bit as important, Chris. You have to put the right people. It starts with putting the right people. People, you know, I, I hate to say this, but just because this person is a former player, uh, you know, doesn't mean he's qualified for it. Just because they have a license, does it qualify them? Really? Why do so many of these so-called coaches make stupid decisions on the pitch? They don't even have a clue when to make the right substitution. I remember covering the national team and I was hollering from behind. And I asked me, the officer, make the switch, make the sub. 70th minute, make that switch. <clears throat> the coach makes it like 10 minutes later. It's a little bit too late. Of course, it's a gamble. I'm not blaming him, but you should have made that switch right there and then. By the time you put in that player, it was too late to make an impact. And then someone was asking me from the media, Rick, why were you calling out, you know, are you upset? With no, I'm just saying you needed to make this, you know, if that person's not functioning, then that's why there's substitutions. You have to make, you have to, it's a gutsy move. You have to make it. I understand, as they say in the vernacular, manok mo eh, manok mo. Pero hindi. Hindi You do what is right for the game. You do what is right for the moment. So Chris, uh, it, uh, first and foremost, you have to put the right people the right people in the right position. You know, um, if it means paying them, then pay them. Or if not, um, you know, the, the good people, the right people will not do everything for money. They will do it because they love, they love the game. So I see a lot of people there. Their heart is in the right place, but probably their mind is not in the right place. Or their capability or their skill set is not in the right place. I don't want to call them out, but the, it's there. You see people like that, and it's sad. It's really sad. So oh, no wonder we're like this. You know? yeah, that, that's one. And then what, what, is, what has not happened over the years? Chris, um, what is still the same? Financial literacy. They, it's still the same problem. People don't get the responsibilities of uh, corporate sponsorship, of media and promotions, the same problems. They've, they're hounding us. 
it might be a little better now because only because of the success of 2010 you know uh, that that when you, if you look back at 2010 that that team was not only special but what happened was special it it spurred the sport into a higher plane a higher level of awareness all of a sudden overnight people are playing in pitches everywhere you, you couldn't even get in the bgc pitch there swear to god makalaro ka noon you know really tough but it can go back to that level i just think that the game needs to be cleaned up because i remember after we missed out in 2014 especially 2016 people were saying ah oh, you know wala mahina i ask out it's not very good but those are the casual fans the diehard fans will tell you now, you know, these things happen in cycles. Look at Germany, they bombed out of the last World Cup. But, you know, there's a nonstop thing education, getting the right people, understanding the program. I think people need to under- understand what Germany did, what Vietnam did to be at the top of its game, why they're the class of Southeast Asia. You know, I was talking to a journalist from Korea the other night, and it wasn't until Korea beating Germany. The uh, people start, and they, they have a far, they have far more superior football players who are playing all over the world. It's just that there's no respect for their local federation or even their local league. But the last World Cup, everything has turned around in terms of football in South Korea. And uh, I was talking to one of the journalists who covered that, and uh, he he made that observation. So, you know, our problems are probably no different from other countries, except for those in Europe or even in the United States. But what makes what makes different is that there's, there's unity. They put in the right people. I think uh, what Vietnam did by by working with Arsenal and the uh, French club has really paved wonders. Because more than half their national team comes, they all come com- come from those academies. We have to understand that. Uh, you know, uh, I'll give an example, Jing, and Chris. Several years ago, the Manchester United Football Academy came to the Philippines, and uh, I covered it. It was held at UMAC, and I was sitting seated in the in the stands with some of the local coaches. And one of the local coaches, uh, I'm not going to mention his name, but here he's made a name for himself in local football. He said that oh, this is sad. So he said it in the vernacular. This is sad. You see the kids paying attention to the Brits. But we teach the same thing. Why? Because they're united or they're white. That's exactly what this coach, these coaches were saying. And I said, um, maybe more of united, not because they're white. But I said, maybe you're, with all due respect, maybe it's not because they're from united. Maybe it's because they don't respect you. And they, they were all silent. They were all, all the coaches were silent. Like, because if you're, imp- it, that's why we need inspirational leaders, inspirational coaches. You look at our coaches. Yeah, they, they yell, they yell, they yell. Come on, dude. Yelling is fine, but if you keep yelling, it's going to go out the other ear. You tell, them, tell them what to do, why they need to do it, what they need to get done. Make them, you know, like, um, when I was looking at the national team, I was wondering, like, um, how can they make Phil Young husband run faster? Because Phil was taking a beating out there from the opposing team. They knew that you take down Phil Young Husband, you knock him down, you tackle him. <coughs> In my opinion, they should have um, built Phil's body to take more of that pounding so he'd be the one dishing it out instead of receiving it. Just like what Michael Jordan did against the, the Pistons. But bulk him up without sacrificing his speed. So work on his speed. Chiefy, when he was on the flanks, his biggest asset was his speed. But when he was knocked out by Navy in that match, and that cost him, eventually led to his early retirement, um, we're fortunate that Patrick Reichel took over that slot. But, uh, what, but, but what, what, I, don't know, I don't know how coaches look at it, but from what I've seen, what is their plan for certain players? How do you build up this player? How do you make this player go faster? How do you make this player stronger without losing anything from his skills i don't know how scientific it is but i watch a lot of clinics i watch a lot of practices and i don't see it i see it in some it's all just do this do this you kick the ball here kick that. but 
where's the individual growth? You know, where's the personal growth in terms of their individual aspects of their game? How do you improve certain players? So I wonder. You know, years ago, I got to watch Fabio Capello when he was coaching Madrid. Uh, I got in as a grant from Adidas. And Fabio did not allow... This was in, They won the La Liga that year. We were not allowed to take video because he showed us their training. And this is incredible. Um, they were running a 4-2-3-1 at that time. And he made them jog on the pitch during practice. Information, 4-2-3-1. They had a ball that they passed around. But the formation would move upfield depending on the guys on how they would run. It was a silent drill. They never spoke during the drill. Capello's reasoning was, if you're playing at the Bernabeu or even in Camp Nou, you won't be able to talk to one another because there's so many people out there. So you learn by watching your teammates and how they move. You learn from hand signals or eye, or eye contact. So they were moving. Now, depending on who had the ball, backpedaled. Everyone backpedaled. Now you move in. Now you change your shape. How do you move into the defensive position? It was an incredible drill, and I, I remember coming back and saying, "Hey, coach, this is what I saw." And I know one team tried to replicate it, but they couldn't do it. But. Um, they tried it under practice, but they couldn't do it. But that's just because you failed in doing it. That doesn't mean you should try it again. You know, so there are all these innovations. And, I, I, you know, I'm not saying we don't we have work coaches. We have good coaches. But I think they're, one of the aspects that is not explored also is, like, how do you improve certain players, their skill sets? What are we looking for? Like, okay, this year, if you got X number of tackles, how do you get him back to make more tackles or toughen him up? How do you stop those balls from coming inside the box? What do you do? Um, do you talk about certain situations? What do you make use of video? All that. And I watch so many UFL games. So many. I've seen other leagues also. I, I, I was crazy enough to go to San Beda on a Sunday to watch Ang Liga. I'd only be the, I'm the only guy there, aside from the players and their girlfriends, watching matches. And I'm not saying I'm, I know everything. I don't. I don't. There are a lot far more learned people than me, but these are my observations. I definitely think that we have a good product. We just need to improve the product, but we need good people running the show. And I think they're not, there are people who are running the show are not very good. I don't want to name them here. So that sounds a lot like more in the technical department of things or in the, in the development department side of uh, that's one aspect that's one aspect the quality of the game um i thought you were going to go after the media people or the marketing or um given that you were speaking a lot quite a lot about uh, those sides of the game uh earlier on um definitely in the club scene it seems to be something that needs to be worked on um yeah. as you said developing stars creating you know, recognizable faces and uh, individuals that people can draw a connection with yeah um you're right. You know, there's, there's, there's plenty. I mean, yeah. it, it seems like if we're going to go down this hole or, or this path, it might turn into a two-hour conversation. <laughs> that's, that's okay. Yeah, <laughs> right? Yeah. That's okay. I remember Chris saying yeah, he could go on and on. And there's just yeah. really so much to talk about when it comes to the local game and how we fix it. But it's going to need all hands on deck. People, good people. We'll start off with good people. Once you get good people in the game... People who care about the game with no agendas, you know, uh, no agendas, right? Other than to grow the game. Yeah, because if you come in and I want to be, you know, like I want to run for PFF president because there are a lot of pricks that come into it, then you're going there for the pricks. You're not yeah. doing, <laughs> you're not going to be there because you're doing it for the game. But what pricks that you can get out of it, you know? So there's a lot, you know. Uh, I remember when Loyola went to the Singapore Cup, some people were complaining, why are they there? They didn't even win the league. It should be us. And there's a point. But then again, a lot of it was not defined. So people, the people in the game need to define 
a lot of these things, you know? Right. So there's a lot, man. There's a lot. But I, I'd, I'll always go with getting good people. When you get good people, yeah. the rest will follow because their heart's in the right place, you know? It seems like there's enough of those people, you know, floating around these days. <laughs> Chris, but, is there anything else that you wanted to, 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 to jump in into? No, I think I think Rick's covered a lot there in, in, in the during the course of the interview. You know, I think there's a lot of things that reiterate some of the points that we want to harp on about really on our show that the sense of community needs to be cultivated and developed obviously the need for more homegrown stars um to enable the the local community to connect because there is that sense of um that could be me you know there is that connection you know that that could be me that could be my that could be my son or daughter who i can uh it resonates with with with, with the community i think that's a really important thing that um that Rick highlighted. I mean, I'm sure the media stuff is, is, is particularly Im- important to you, Jim, yeah. and, and something that you can really associate with, you know. And I think that that's a huge one, you know, just in terms of building the brand and building the identity of the clubs, you know, to enable you to connect with that organisation. I think that's, that's distinctly lacking. I'm hoping that now that we will converge on the NCR, that that's something that might be a little bit easier to manage, um, and I hope clubs do their do their bit to to try to um, connect and engage with the communities, whatever the community might be. But I, I definitely think Rick's on the right path with trying to engage with schools and and youth um, for for a multitude of different reasons. Not just because they're the fans that might come out and watch, not just because they could be the players of the future, but also because they're going to be the brand managers of the future. They're going to be the yeah. people when they get to certain age. They're going to be the ones that are going to say, "Hey, why don't you go and sponsor that club?" Because I know that they did they did great things for me growing up in my community, and I want to try to you know help them out and, and give back because I believe in in the product that they're trying to put out. Mm. But the overarching theme here, Jing, is this a slow burn? It is yeah. a slow burn. It is a slow process. We can't just be trying to um, do things overnight and we've all got to chip in and do our part. You know, it's not as, as, as simple as thinking that it's going to be fixed tomorrow and that another miracle in Hanoi will inject, you know, some newfound impetus and it's going to be the catalyst for something great because it's only going to last so long. It's Chris, only going to last so long. Chris, there needs to be some real sustainability in this. Yes, Rick. Chris, Chris Jen, can I share one more thing? Um, sure. I, I, I was not able to mention this earlier. I think in in football, everyone has to, what is our end game? Everyone has to ask, what is the end game? Is it the World Cup? That, that's it. So if we're here right now, and this is the World Cup, how do we get from here to there? So what are all the steps that we need to take to get us there? So that has to be crafted. Grassroots, clubs financial literacy, and so on and so forth. How do we get there? That has to be plotted. Once that is plotted, we stick to that road. Yeah. If we're going to be taking shortcuts, we're not getting there because you circumvent the process. Mm-hmm. You cannot shortchange the process. That's why it's going and it just process. And it just sets us back even further, Rick. Exactly. It just sets us back even further. So we think in the, in the short term, we're making these small gains or quick gains, but we're not. All we're doing is, 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 like you said, circumventing back to the beginning again or worse yeah. still, you know, taking even more backward steps. No, I totally agree with that. And again, I know you said that you haven't managed to catch up with many of the episodes, but it's something that is, uh, I'm gonna be watching. is a consistent point that we bring up regularly mm-hmm. throughout all of the themes. It's points that not just Jing and I bring up, but the players bring up when they have conversations with us that, you know, other people from the football community that we've had on have made these points. So I'm hoping that in this lockdown period, there's been enough time for reflection from everyone concerned to be able to set up some kind of roadmap um, to enable the football community to get excited, to have this, as you know, I said it before, as a watershed moment that perhaps we can use this lockdown period, this COVID period as an opportunity to build forward for the future generations because we can't continue down this path, Rick. That's what I know. We can't no. continue to, no. to try to make these, uh, you know, shortcuts and you know, fixes. That's not going to work. We need to We need to be really willing to batten down the hatches and be like, right, we're in this for the long haul. Mm. And, um, 
yeah, that, that's definitely a theme that's run throughout, Rick. So I'm really glad that you shared that because I think that's it's a common thread. It's a common thread with us. Yeah, yeah. Would you would you agree, Jing? Yeah. A hundred percent. You know, um, it's been tremendous having you on here, Rick. And, uh, you Thank know, you. Um, it'll be interesting to see how things transpire in the near future if the right people do indeed get into place. Uh, what I do know is uh, I, I was introduced to you when I was coming up as a, as a, as a writer of football here in, in the Philippines. And um, th- during that time, I was thinking, you know, there's people like Rick, there's people like Ryan Phoenix, Bob Guerrero, Sedelf was out there, and yeah. I was thinking, man, there's there's a lot of good writers um, that are covering the game, and I am. It's it's nice to be a part of that, you know. Yeah. And not even ten years later, you know, you you've been away for a little while. Bob has been away. Ryan still comes in from time to time, but it's been, you know, the the community is not what it was in in, in that department, and. Um, having the right people, regardless of perhaps you know a bit of friction here and there uh, between some personalities, I think what's important is that we get the people involved. And unfortunately, circumstances have pulled people away from the game that mm-hmm. I feel as if uh, could contribute a, a tremendous amount in, ter- in terms of value for the game and, and understanding and getting the word out there of not only the matches and the results, but the stories behind them. And I think that's what you've been, uh, um, it's been really refreshing to get back to like, the personality and the, the, the nitty gritty and the back behind the scenes stuff, because that's sort of um, something that we've um, been a little bit dry of. I think, in my mind, at least not as much as it used to be. So it's nice to have you back writing football, and I look forward to Thank you. to seeing more of that, you know, and hopefully well, seeing you around in the games. Jing, the master plan will be unveiled in a few weeks, like uh, leading up to something. Because once non, non, what Sir Nonong said was, we do not need to wait for everything to get back to normal for this to happen. We can start. But mm. once, it, once there's a vaccine and we can all meet together, we're going to hit the ground running. Those were his words. And he was very much excited. In fact, he texted me the other night. Hey, Rick, how's it going on that plan? I said, sir, uh, I'll be done this weekend. It's highly detailed what we all need to do. And it's going to need you, Chris, Toby, and everyone else to be in on it. Everyone will find their own part in that playground to make it happen. But if people are not going to join in because we need good people in there, then it ain't happening. That's for well, sure. I hope you keep us updated on everything we that will. transpires. I, once, once Sir Nono gives the green light, I can share it with you. We can talk about it in detail. Yep. Look for him on social media. He's Rick Olivares on Twitter. I, I believe that's where you're most uh, um, active. Is that correct? Uh, Facebook. Facebook. I finally opened my Facebook. It's now public. It's no longer private. So. There you go. Yeah. Uh, um, Rick is very busy these days, putting out a lot of uh, great content uh, on the internet and also uh, he's going to be putting up a, a workshop yeah. um, so you're going to learn a little bit about sports journal- journalism is that correct? No it's right um, it's because when people talk about journalism think people think about news no it's not just that so there are many mm. avenues I, I taught this in Ateneo I taught there for three plus years I taught this in USD as well in, in San Beda there's a lot uh, it's getting your interest whether in writing and taking photography and doing videos because oh, media is just really so nebulous today with social media so it's harnessing that and making it work for yourself for a career or even helping your business Beautiful. in fact really San Agustin is one of the guys who signed up and I'll be helping him uh, do what he can for his business and there's a way that journalism can be infused into his own RSA production so beautiful yeah mm. All right, so um, we hope everybody um, looks out for that and, and supports it if you're Thank if you. it's along your interests. Um, yeah, if you enjoyed this episode, this conversation with Rick Olivares, we do hope that you subscribe to the podcast on YouTube, Spotify, and on Apple Pad uh, Apple Podcast. Is that what I was going to say? <laughs> Apple Podcast. Um, we appreciate your support. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chris. Any last words? No, that was brilliant. Except for your outro. Uh, <laughs> brilliant. Uh, no, thanks a lot, Rick. It's uh, You're you know, it, it's, it's been great for you to come on and um, share your thoughts. You know, I got to share mine on your show, so it's great to have uh, your perspective on it. You know, I hope we can get some of your, the old band together. Maybe uh, get Ryan out of his uh, his slumber. I know Bob might be a slightly <laughs> difficult uh, entity to wake up, but yeah, I, I saw I saw that Ryan was back writing and stuff. 
I think this this past week he put something out. So yeah, it's good. It's great to see you back writing again. I hope the rest of the crew can get back involved as well because, like you said, we need good people and 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 those Thank those you. aforementioned individuals. Will, will certainly help. So, so thanks for coming. Well, on. you guys really, are doing good. Really work. appreciate Thank it. Also, thank you. All right, uh, Rick Olivares, folks, on this Football Friday. We'll catch you next time.